They bent wood like it was warm wax. The medieval wood-bending bath, you see, made perfect boards. Wood has always fought back. It splits, it twists, it, well, refuses to obey straight lines. And yet medieval builders figured out how to make stubborn timber curve, flex, and lock into shape with almost surgical precision. No factories, no laminates, no synthetic glues, just heat, water, time, and a ruthless understanding of how trees actually behave. This wasn't folk magic. This was applied survival science. And once you understand how the medieval woodbending bath worked, modern woodworking suddenly looks, um, a little less impressive. This knowledge mattered because medieval life depended on curved wood, barrels that didn't leak, ship ribs that could survive storms, roof beams that carried weight without snapping, tool handles that didn't shatter in winter, straight boards were easy, perfect curves were the difference between success and failure. Sometimes, you know, even between life and death. This is where the wood-bending bath comes in. How medieval builders learned to soften trees without breaking them is, well, quite fascinating. Medieval craftsmen understood something fundamental that, honestly, many modern builders forget. Wood isn't dead. It's actually a bundle of fibres held together by natural binders. Lignin is the glue. Cellulose is the muscle. Heat and moisture weaken lignin just enough to let the fibres slide instead of snap. The bending bath was built around that truth. Long troughs were carved from stone or assembled from thick planks sealed with pitch. These baths were filled with water and heated slowly over fire, not boiling not violent, controlled heat. The goal wasn't to cook the wood, it was to persuade it. Boards were submerged for hours, sometimes days. Thickness determined time. Thin staves softened quickly. Ship timbers took patience. The heat drove moisture deep into the grain, loosening the internal bonds. When pulled from the bath, the wood behaved differently. It felt heavier, rubber-like, willing. This is why, you know, medieval curves look alive instead of forced. They weren't, ah, cut into shape. They were coaxed there. Why bending baths beat cutting curves every time? Cutting curves across grain weakens wood. Medieval builders knew this through failure, really. A cut curve snaps under stress. A bent curve redistributes force along continuous fibres. That strength you simply can't fake. Barrel staves are the perfect example, honestly. Each stave curves inward, held by tension, not nails. If those staves were cut to shape, barrels would split under pressure. Instead, softened boards were bent around forms while still warm, then locked in place as they cooled and dried. The same logic applied to bows, sled runners, wheel rims, chair backs and roof braces. Curved wood made this way absorb shock instead of resisting it. That flexibility, you know, really mattered in cold climates where brittle materials fail fast. Medieval people didn't have stress charts. They had broken tools and hard winters. The bath survived because it worked. The forms were just as important as the bath. The bath softened the wood. The form decided its future. 
Forms were carved from stone, packed earth, or stacked planks shaped to the desired curve. Once removed from the bath, boards were clamped, wedged, or roped tightly into position. Speed mattered. As the wood cooled, lignin stiffened again. Missed that window, and the board fought back. Some builders, you know, use gradual bends over several days. Others, well, they forced sharper curves in just one session. The deeper the soak, the more aggressive the bend could be. Experience really determined everything. If you went too fast, the wood would split internally. But if you were too slow, it would set wrong. Once bent, the board had to stay locked in place until it was fully dry. Sometimes that meant waiting for weeks. Removing it early, though, risked spring back. Medieval builders, quite cleverly, accounted for this by overbending slightly, knowing the wood would relax just enough. That's craftsmanship built on prediction, not guesswork. Now, why do water and heat together outperform steam alone, you might wonder. Steam bending, you know, gets all the attention these days, but back in medieval times, baths often did a better job, especially for thick stock. See, steam heats up the surface really quickly, but, well, it struggles to penetrate deeply unless you ramp up the pressure. Baths, on the other hand, allowed heat and moisture to soak right through the entire board, and did so quite evenly. This was actually quite important for structural pieces. Think ship ribs, wagon parts, or those hefty load-bearing beams. Even heating helped reduce internal stress, which is precisely why some medieval timbers show almost no microfracturing, even after centuries. In colder regions, folks would drop ashes or hot stones into the bath to keep the temperature up. In warmer climates, sometimes solar-heated water was enough. Adaptation was always happening, but the underlying principle never changed. This wasn't a one-size-fits-all system, not at all. It was always carefully tuned to both the environment and the material at hand. Where this technique quietly shaped history, the bending bath shows up anywhere curved wood really mattered. Maritime cultures, you know, relied on it heavily. Ships without bent ribs simply don't survive waves, and land-based builders used it for arches, snow-load-resistant roofs, sleds and wheels. Even agricultural tools benefited. Bent handles absorb shock and reduce fatigue. That really matters when survival depends on your body lasting through winter. There's a reason medieval tools feel balanced in the hand. That balance, well, it was engineered. During World War II, emergency shipyards and aircraft factories rediscovered similar principles when metal shortages forced a return to laminated and bent wood components. The physics hadn't changed. Only the timeline did. Old methods don't disappear because they stop working. They disappear because they stop being convenient. How this knowledge still applies right now. This isn't museum trivia. You can use this. If you're building a small cabin, bent roof braces distribute snow load better than straight ones. Soak green or air-dried wood in hot water for several hours, then bend over a simple jig. Let it dry completely before installation. For tool handles, a gentle bend improves ergonomics and strength. 
Heat water to near boiling, soak the handle blank, bend slowly, and clamp until dry. No glue needed, the grain stays continuous. Survival shelters benefit too. Bent poles create stronger frames with less material. That matters when resources are limited and exposure kills fast. Even furniture makers can learn from this, you know. Chairs? Well, they often fail at the joints. Bent backs, though, they help reduce joint stress. Medieval builders actually solved that centuries ago. The materials are simple, really. The patience, however, that's the price. Why did medieval builders trust this method with their lives? Well, when a barrel leaks, food spoils. When a ship rib fails, people drown. When a roof collapses under snow, families die. Medieval builders didn't romanticize technique, no. They trusted what survived. The wood bending bath survived because it delivered repeatable results with minimal resources. Fire, water, time. Knowledge passed hand to hand. This wasn't innovation for innovation's sake. It was refinement through consequence. You know, modern builders chase speed. Medieval builders, on the other hand, chased reliability. That's the difference. What this reveals about medieval intelligence is, well, quite telling. There's a quiet arrogance in assuming ancient people were just guessing their way through problems. They weren't. They were running long-term experiments with brutal feedback loops. Methods that failed vanished. Methods that worked became tradition. The bending bath is proof. It combines material science, thermal control, and structural engineering without equations. Just observation, sharpened by survival. That's not primitive. That's disciplined. If you care about history that actually teaches something useful, this is the kind of knowledge worth preserving. Techniques that don't just explain the past, but improve how we build, adapt and endure. If this kind of deep, practical history is why you're here, make sure you subscribe to History HQ. Share this with someone who still thinks old world methods were inferior. And keep these techniques alive, because knowledge that survives centuries is worth more than trends that won't last a decade.